What we notice with mothers with Munchausen by proxy, and I say mothers because 95% are, is that they'll bring the child to the doctor, they'll say something's terribly wrong, you've got to figure out what it is, and the doctor does a bunch of tests and then says, we can't find anything wrong. Instead of being like a normal parent, oh, phew, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for reassuring me. These mothers will be upset. What do you mean nothing's wrong? Oh no, you've got to keep working. And they will find expert after expert for second opinion and fifth opinion. These people are not insane. They are exceedingly calculated. They plan, they hide the behavior, they go to great lengths to maintain that they're right. I remember there was a medication that I was allergic to and my mother would give me too much of that medication and then take pictures, show them to the doctor and say, this is when she ate sugar. So I was having a legitimate reaction, but it was not to what she was saying it was. I didn't think I was allergic to sugar. I would have a candy bar here and there and I would have no reaction to it. But at the time, I really didn't understand what was going on. When perpetrators of Munchausen syndrome by proxy finally get the diagnosis they've been searching for, they almost have a, uh, ah, uh, well, and you can almost see the gratification. I do have mixed emotions about not growing up with a father around. There's so many things that I wish that I could have experienced with him or experienced in general. <laughs> but I look at my sister and I look at all the things that my sister got to do that I never got to. And for a long time, I have been very jealous of my sister. And it's stupid, but the simple fact that she grew up with our father, she got to have him at prom, she got to have him teach her how to ride a bike. All the things that I never got to. And it hurts. I think about what could have been. I look at her, my sister, and I think maybe I would have just been just like her if I would have lived with my dad. You know, maybe I would have been cheerleading captain or something, you know. I want that opportunity for my father to guide me like a, a real parent should. But I do feel like my father doesn't want to tell me what to do because I have been told what to do my whole life. And I know that he wants me to make my own choices. I think my first memory of Gypsy was me, my mom, and dad were laying in their bed. And I think it might have been a birthday or something that we had called her for. And we sung her happy birthday on the phone. God knows how old I was. But that's probably the first memory I have, just because I was so young. I was two when she'd come to the house or when we would actually be able to see her. I remember growing up and Gypsy being a lot older than I was, but she was into dolls and princesses. And I was never that kid. You know, I had maybe one baby doll and I was more like a tomboy, you know, growing up with an older brother and being around all his friends. But I remember her talking about princesses and always wanting to go to Disney World, Star Wars, all that stuff. And I was like, maybe that's just how she is. I don't know, I didn't judge her for it. I just thought it was a little odd, a little strange. So around 14, that's when I started really craving that sister bond. Having somebody to, you know, do my makeup with or teach me how to do makeup. I would play in my mom's stuff, um, but I was like, you know, it'd be cool to have a sister and all my friends had sisters, you know, that they got to share their clothes with, they got to do things with. And I missed out on that. I had a brother that liked to ride four wheelers. So that's what I grew up doing. I didn't grow up playing with makeup with my brother. I don't think it's fair that I got to miss out on that, but 
that kind of makes me sound selfish because it's also not fair to her. She missed out on just as much as I did. I may have missed out on, you know, having a sister, but I still got to go to prom. She missed out on having a sister, but she couldn't walk. You know, she missed out on so many things. We both missed out on a lot, just different levels of things that we should be doing at, you know, the ages that we were. Even though I wasn't having in-person visits with my father, we would still occasionally talk on the phone. But my mother was right beside me, telling me exactly what to tell him. When I'd talk to her, she would say, I'm a little tired or something. But she just seemed like a normal kid, apart from having to be helped in and out of the wheelchair. Uh, she seemed like a trooper. She was happy. She never complained about any of it. Not seeing my father for six years didn't have hardly any effect on me or my emotional state because I wasn't allowed to have a relationship with my father. My mother used to talk about my father in such negative light, so it wasn't like I missed him in any way because my mother had manipulated me to think that he didn't love me or want to be a part of my life. Gypsy is not biologically my daughter, but she's mine, you know, in every sense of the way. I treat her the same way I treat Dylan and Mia. If she does something wrong or whatever, I call her out on it too, you know, because I don't want to treat her fragile or, or any different. I want to treat her just like I treat them, which is the fair thing to do. I mean, I'm very blunt with her. Before having a discussion or something, I'll tell her, look, what I'm about to say might hurt your feelings, but, and you know, and then I'll say what I have to say, and, and you know, she understands, she gets it. You know, she started calling me mom. I want to say it was about six months in, I took baby steps with her. I never pressured her and asked her, you know, what happened? Tell me this, tell me this. I just figured when she's ready to tell me things, you know, she'll tell me. And she, there's things that still we don't know that she wants to wait to tell us when, you know, she gets home. And I can understand that. You know, I respect that. We have a strong bond now. I will never forget our first conversation. She was very fragile and not wanting to, you know, share too much. And of course, all her life she grew up, lying's okay, lying's okay. So we, we broke her, you know, slowly broke her out of that. I mean, she's still, you know, just like every other child on this world, in this world, you have to be responsible. You have to be, you know, honest. Because my villain and me tell me everything. Sometimes they give me too much information, but they tell me everything. And that's the, the kind of relationship Gypsy and I have. I always told her, you know, you can tell me anything, I will not judge you. You're a human, and I love you. This was 2014. How old she would have been 2014? 22, 23. Look how, she looks like she's 12. She doesn't look like she's in her 20s. This poor child. Gypsy's growth has been amazing. From this little meek girl, from our first conversation to not wanting to talk, 
and being reserved, which I don't blame her, you know, because of what she grew up hearing about me from her mom. Till now, she has a backbone. She says what she wants. She has no problem saying how she feels. Sometimes I ask her, you sure I didn't have you? <laughs> you know? I want to say that I kind of helped her become who she is in that sense. Because I don't sugarcoat with her, I've always sort of speak your truth. You know, be proud. And she's sticking up for herself where she wouldn't before. You know, she got hounded a good bit when she was in prison, you know, the first, for a while. And then she started growing a backbone and just saying, I'm gonna tell you this, and if you don't like it, well, I'm sorry. She's not the same girl, not at all, not even close. It's a total transformation. I mean, just to see her, her have hair <laughs> was enough, but her confidence level is amazing. You know, she's, she's tough, Crocky, she's tough.